foot regrowth serums and whatnot. I love the guy. I love the guy trying to sell his serum serums to to fix any malady. Like that guy. I was so happy when he came back. Oh, the chicken fucker. Oh. <laughs> Such a hook. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we are breaking down the first two episodes of Fallout and I'm joined by Kevin and so excited to get into this. This first episode will be on my channel. The second episode will be on his channel. That'll be linked so make sure you go over there so that you can get all of the episodes. And mm -hmm. it's it's a cozy evening session for me. I'm so excited to talk about all of these different plot points and characters that are introduced like right off the bat in this first episode. Was there a character segment that you felt more attached to or? Oh man, I think that there is a kind of like naivety that I just so much loved with the, the Lucy plotline just starting right out the gate with that. Uh, I felt like it was a great, great intro to like the how you kind of when you start playing a game and you want to like just make the best choices that you can and just be nice to everybody yeah they're really Sweet they're really summer captured child that well. <laughs> yeah yeah because <laughs> like no. when you play these games you're like it's like you can make the decision to kill the person or to to escalate but like usually you like you're like oh let's see if we can try the nice way uh sometimes or maybe the first time <laughs> i love that because later on in the series Cooper slash the ghoul, he tells Lucy, he's like, you're going to become me now. Like, the longer you're out here, you're going to lose that part of yourself. And I mean, yeah, like, as you're going throughout this whole series, I, lo I loved the beginning, like the entire vault segment of Lucy. <laughs> And then her introduction to her marriage partner. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's wiping himself off on the curtains. And like, <laughs> I had chills down the back of my neck. I'm like, oh no, this is this is not good. This this guy mm -hmm. is not. Mm -mm. But yeah, like they, they really, they really went into it like super fast too. Like it didn't feel like there was a lot of time to really like take it in. It was really quick. Mm -hmm. yeah like it's like oh i saw someone comment i think i saw a couple like live tweets about it then someone was like oh wow that's like the um, red wedding on the first episode kind of thing kind of yeah stuff, so yeah i like i liked it though i'm really attached to everything that's been shown like pre you know like the 200 years before so yes. like cooper's storyline at the birthday party and him with his daughter like they did such a good job of setting him up as like, I don't want to say a sympathetic villain, but like you really understand who he was and who he's become. But I found it really interesting just how like they really went ahead and gave like this like pre segment to everything going on. Really appreciated that. I think he's he's the storyline that i think i was the most excited for mm -hmm. until things start kicking off in the vault and we start getting mysteries in 30 and 33 like then i was like "Ooh, okay every time we bounced back i was super excited to see what was going on and then somehow they weave him into the mysteries too like it's just i think that that's the biggest win of this show is that it it combines the different storylines in such a way that they they seem so separate and so distinct but then the further along you get you're like oh no it's all just the same storyline they're they're all yeah. interconnected and it's very well done it was seamless it really was i i mean we had talked before recording but i really expected something more like an action series kind of where it was just maybe a little bit slapstick you know like the games are a little bit goofy and like mm -hmm. i'm okay with that I do uh I do think though that like when it was presented I was like okay now I feel like I need to start taking notes like they've made it very complex or maybe not very complex but more complex than I initially was prepared for <laughs> yeah they definitely was like it was like um like oh this is just gonna be a fun fun romp you know I, I don't have to have my brain on too much but then you're yeah. like oh I should probably pay attention to what's actually going on on those computer <laughs> screens every single time uh because they're not like they're not going to put something on screen that isn't important and that that was i think an important point to make is like sometimes 
you know, it's not to say that every every decision in cinematography doesn't matter, but sometimes it's there to look nice. Sometimes it's set yeah. dressing, and then sometimes it's there. You need to be you need to be paying attention to this, um, or yeah. something to catch on your on your rewatch kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that always makes for the best uh, series when you know that there is potential for like a good rewatch and to pick up multiple things. Cause we watched the episodes twice now and I'm still finding many things. Absolutely. I, I wanted to talk about Maximus a little bit and the Brotherhood of Steel because <laughs> like, I love, like, I love the whole like paladin aspect. Like they really fit into this narrative of like, almost like this dogmatic, like lawfulness that, you know, mm -hmm. Wheel of Time fans, like you get that with a lot of like kind of like sect like cultures and groupings of people. And I found the Brotherhood storyline really interesting too. Like I could have watched an entire episode just dealing with all of these guys learning the ropes and going through training and stuff. I, I loved that whole segment as well. So they really did a good job of like having each distinct character fitting kind of a like distinct archetype, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the the games, one of the biggest like selling points of the games is like the moral choices and the fact that, you know, you choosing to whether to escalate a conflict with violence or taking a diplomatic route or taking a self-serving route, it does impact the game and impacts how people perceive you. There is like a reputation, there's like a karma system. And you can see like, obviously the ghoul is the guy who plays through the game and makes whatever decision suits his his interest the best. And then Maximus is very much a, he has a strict code he sticks to. And, you know, whether that hurts people or not is not really, he's kind of like a true neutral almost. Yeah. And then Lucy's like the, like the, the pure good. Like that's just like the full goody two shoes play through. Don't want to yeah. kill anybody. You don't have to kill kind of stuff. <laughs> Pass as many speech checks as you can. Yeah. <laughs> she, I mean, they, they couldn't have picked like a greater casting for Lucy. Like, but I think with the brotherhood, this might be the first segment where we learn about this like mission about like an enclave runaway. So like mm -hmm. that really piqued my interest. And then of course, you know, we have the whole, issue where Maximus ends up being like he's allowed to go now because mm -hmm. I forget Zelia. It's Mendes. our first mystery too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dane. It's Dane. Ironically okay. enough, Dane like Dane Bornholz. Because <laughs> <laughs> they are kind of like the white cloaks. But yeah, they are. Somewhat, somewhat like favorably a little bit. But um, yeah. Dane. Yeah, and that's so our like, first mystery too. Yeah, it was really great. And I think that's another thing. Like, I loved Cooper's story. I loved everything that happened in the vault, like the fight, the the sound, the music, like everything was perfect. But then with the Brotherhood, we've got the Enclave thing, the mystery about it. And I just really enjoyed the characters, like how it really felt like a militaristic, like boot camp where you've got people just acting fools, but also like away from home and, you know, like young men doing stuff under the covers. <laughs> like... I only caught that last <laughs> night when I was rewatching it. I did not see that the first time I watched it. Um... Oh, I was cracking up. I was like, is that? Okay. That's exactly <laughs> what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But if, I... if you're curious, if you missed it, just look at the scene. I think it's right before Dane wakes up um, and has the accident with the boot. Uh, th there's, a, there's a slow pan across the barracks and you just see a little bit of a tent post that's moving up and down <laughs> under a blanket. And I think you can put two and two together. Yeah. Uh, what's going on there. It felt almost, it felt kind of similar to like some of the boys episodes where like there is a little bit of like, like very slightly like raunchy humor, but it's concealed enough that where if like, I think you weren't paying attention, you wouldn't catch it. <laughs> but I had a blast. I certainly didn't. <laughs> yeah. So was there anything in this first episode that we want to kind of like focus on or? No, I think that um, what, what might be good to know is, uh, so what's like kind of your experience, which which of the games and which, you know, how deep have you gotten into Fallout as like a IP prior to this um, as far as, you know, kind of your base level. So I can, because yeah. if there's anything about like any of the factions that you've seen um, that I can help clarify too, I'd love to do. Yeah. So 
most of my questions come further down the line, especially with okay. like episode two, the Enclave stuff. But I played four and okay. that was pretty much, I mean, like it, it was like two weeks of my life and I barely remember any of it because I don't think I did anything else besides play. And then once I had hoarded enough bottle caps, I was just making like massive trash mansions. <laughs> and <laughs> it sounds like you played the game right, honestly. <laughs> yeah. But episode two, like I had a lot of kind of like uh, more questionable things with Wiltzig. Is that his name? Mm -hmm. Wiltzig? Yep. And what exactly was going on there because you get the feeling like this is a almost like secretive testing base they're absolutely running some type of experiments going on and they're dealing with certain types you know like it looks like chemicals or something you're not sure they've got a guy on a gurney with like a blackened hand with covered with a sheet that they wheel out of there really quick so it felt like this whole segment i was being bombarded by like oh look over here what's happening over there and while that's happening you also get kind of like the the gentle side of this doctor who's kind of like fudged the numbers on the weight of the dog to make sure that it's not thrown in the incinerator so like he's automatically in my eyes kind of set up to be a pretty sim sympathetic dude and then it's like off to the races and he's running out of there and so mm. i wasn't sure exactly if when i guess it's like a, a a guard or someone comes in and pulls the alarm i wasn't sure if it was because of the substance that he like shot into his neck went like missing or something or they found the dog like i wasn't exactly sure what led up to this event mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, would you like to dive into that now or do you? Yeah, or do you sure. Want to... OK, perfect. So the Enclave is I first remember them. They might even be in like the one and two a little bit, um, but they're really the primary antagonist of Fallout 3, uh, which is set in like around the D.C. area. The Capital Wasteland is what they, they kind of call it. And they're they're really they're they're basically the remnants of the US government that had their own bunker, they had their own kind of vault, as if you will. So uh, they they kind of emerged at some point and were like, all right, time to reclaim America. And they're very much an antagonistic force in those early games uh, that more or less get dealt with They like we kind of assume that they're kind of gone, or at least underground and, and very kind of scattered. But this sh the show obviously has revealed that they still definitely have their facilities. Um, they're more than capable of kind of kind of staying underground and laying low because uh, their main adversary in Fallout 3 was the Brotherhood of Steel. Uh, okay. And that's really the most favorable game for the Brotherhood. That's like the most protagonist that group ever is. They're very much, hey, these are the heroes. You know, this is the hero mm -hmm. faction. Um, and b after that, it's much more back to the morally gray uh, group. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what we see there is, is you know, a facility that they have that's, you know, he's a scientist for the Enclave. He, he probably has, um, he demonstrates, you know, deep knowledge of all the vaults because, you know, the government and vault tech were kind of in cahoots a little bit, uh, as we've learned as well. So he is, you know, a runaway scientist. He was obviously helping with them with whatever their experiments were. And I think the alarm being pulled was because he had a illegal dog i think that i okay. do think that it was is down to the dog because i don't think he would have known that he had put the device into his neck i'm, I'm not really sure yeah if i wasn't that, but... sure if like something went missing and like i don't yeah. know like it it they left it kind of vague which i guess is a good thing because if mm -hmm. they want to like wrap that up in a season two and go more into like what what type of testing and what type of materials they have there i mean that's always on the table so i don't mind anything being kind of open-ended like that but yep. i did i really liked that intro like it was great yeah, it was awesome. And then obviously, you know, we got to see it, it's it's nice, too, because we get to see um, how like it's almost justification or at least laying the groundwork why this dog is so such a useful companion, uh, well trained from the get go, uh, nice and loyal as can be, but also uh, a Killing vicious killer if it, needs to be. Yeah. Yeah, if it has to be. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if it threatens whoever it chooses its companion as, which is again very true to the games. The the dog, dog you never killed a dog in the game. <laughs> yeah, you can't kill yeah. dog meat. No. Um, and is a great companion uh, to whoever they choose. So, 
Yeah, I think too with this whole segment, it's nice introducing another character. And I mean, he's not around for an incredibly long time. Like he's there and then he's gone pretty much at the end of this episode. But what's nice is how like rounded his character arc is for just being like a one episode dude. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, he, he kind of has a complete arc. Uh, over the course of that one episode that's true yeah. despite being the inciting inf incident almost <laughs> right <laughs> i have to bring up too um knight titus and maximus's whole like adventure together like i for one i love how they get to this area and i think it really speaks to maximus about how like he gets there and he has his eyes on the entire grounds and he's like something's something's up here and he's able to see like there is a person here the subject there was a dog here and then knight titus is like you you go in the cave <laughs> Yeah, it was a great subversion because, like, obviously, you know, you set up these these knights. They're very, they're, you know, you have the dogmatic brotherhood of steel. They're very much zealots. They're they're almost like technophile religious freaks, kind of in a way, and yeah. they just love technology and they they treat it kind of as like these holy items. So you have these big giant men in in, in metal suits, and you're like, oh, these are the these you know these are the badasses. These are the guys who are like you know the big the big guns in the area. And then he's just yeah. kind of a kind of a He's, big baby yeah yeah it was really great and i mean too like i have to just talk about the visual aspect to the brotherhood because i love like the scenery and the visuals overall i mean the vault like the color palette the blue and the yellows but everything with the brotherhood of steel has this almost like mystic like silvery blues there's a couple scenes where they're lifting off into the carriers and they're mm -hmm. flying overhead and it just looks so cool like there's a couple other episode uh, episodes later on where you get to see more of them and more people in power armor and they just look formidable like they just look yeah. cool like i think any little boy like watching that would be like that's who i want to be that's sign me up i want to look cool like that <laughs> Yeah, they're very like it's so it's it's almost like very tempting to root for them. And and you know, we see Lucy make the same mistake. She assumes they're the good guys. They look like good yeah. guys. Right. Uh, you know, why would why would the you know giant literal knights in shining armor kind of thing? Yeah. Absolutely. I think <clears throat> I think too with this whole uh, this whole incident, I think also shows Maximus being a bit more flexible with his morals because at first you think, okay, he's going to be like very lawful and, you know, mm -hmm. very straightforward. But when Knight Titus gets injured and he's like, you know, help, Maximus is kind of like, mm, yeah, maybe not. And so I think too, that was another kind of flip where I was like, oh, okay, so they're not, you know, there is a little bit of differences between the personalities. He's a little bit more flexible and not as like a hardliner as I had previously thought. Yeah, because even Dane says, you know, I told him that you wouldn't hurt a fly. And this is like, I feel like this is the moment where you're like, maybe he did put the, the blade in Dane's boot. Like you're like, he yeah. has the capability to be self-serving and um, you know, take a, he's not, I think this is an important distinction too, like I said, with the morality code is if it was the ghoul, he would have shot him in the head, but Maximus, he's not going to kill him himself. He'll let you die and he'll watch you mm -hmm. die, but he's not going to pull the trigger himself, which is very, I, I, as, as we saw more of him, I was like, they're so consistent with his moral code. He's like, I will do the stuff that I think is the right stuff. And I'm not going to cross my line, right. but I'm not going to go out of my way to help you either. It's very much a, it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting too, because he still wants to carry on with the mission. I mean, he ends yeah. up in Philly where 
I mean, I love this moment because then we have like our first convergence of all three characters and it is absolute mayhem. <laughs> like we've got so much happening, but he steps in to fight the ghoul and you almost see once again, like this more like chivalrous side of him. Like, oh, I can't stand for this, but yep. he's, he's very flexible and fluid <laughs> in his causes. It's great. Yeah. He's a, he's a, he's a great character. I, I'm really excited to see if, because they could have him toe that middle line all throughout and maybe occasionally make one choice or the other that goes either direction but he's the he's the kind of character that you could see them see him either being set up to be like the end game hero or the end game villain and i i think that's really a really fun uh way to kind of make a character like him because he's like he's like kind of timid he's kind of like kind of goofy you know he's got like kind of a very nervous voice almost and it kind of cracks every once in a while and yeah and like, oh he's so innocent but he's not right Right. I think too, I mean, I think for me, this, if we go like the first two episodes, I feel like things really kick off when everyone gets to Philly and we learn more about Moldaver because mm -hmm. the woman who's there who sets up uh, Willig with a new foot, <laughs> she knows <sighs> this name. That, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at it, it, this at this point, do we have to, should we assume that Wilzig is smuggling something out of the Enclave on his own accord? Like, he obviously is in cahoots with someone else, right? Like, yeah, and he has a lot of spoiler. knowledge. Yeah, it's not. And, and he has a lot of knowledge, too. Like, at the towards the end of the episode, he obviously identifies Lucy as McLean. So there, there is more history to him, which I find very interesting that they just kind of left us hanging there because obviously when Moldaver left, she's like, you look like your mom. So we're getting that first hint of people know who Lucy is, who shouldn't know who, who Lucy is. <clears throat> and then you have the same exact thing later on with Wilson and like, all right, how could these people possibly know this person who has never left your vault? And yeah. And even with him too, especially like, I, I, it's hard to know where he's coming from because like I said before, the original Enclave operation that we saw was in DC. They could be somewhere completely different. We have, um, I'll have to go back and see if there's any hints to their location. But uh, as far as how long he's been on the run, maybe he's closer. Maybe they're in a different base that's like in closer to the West Coast because obviously traversing the entire United States with a um, dog and a thing in your neck. Uh, right. It, it's a little bit harder to pull off um, than, you know, maybe making it from like Colorado or like something like that, something right. a little bit closer or like Texas or New Mexico or something like that. So, right. Just um, in the amount, just amount of traveling in the first two episodes with, you know, like raiders and just, you know, wild <laughs> like lunatics yeah. on the road. Like I would be very impressed if they made it from a much further location all the way to Philly. But yeah, it, it's possible, um, you know, and that, that's that's the, the suspension of disbelief that comes with the video games, too. Sometimes yeah. like, how do these people get here from where they were? But then, you know, that's the fun of it. Uh, sometimes, yeah. you know, for the for the rule of cool kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, too, like that's another thing with this show that's nice is because you don't have to feel so well. I, let me let me rewind a little bit, because like any adaptation there's always going to be people who are like that's not exactly how i think it should be and really upset about it but it's whatever <laughs> like... yeah. i mean uh, it's uh, as as a person i've played um you know i first played fallout 3 when i was in college i loved it so much i played the hell out of it and then i played new vegas and then i loved that so much and there was no fallout 4 yet at that point so i got so into the series i went back and played the isometric fallout 1 and 2 so like I've gone through them all. I've played them all multiple times through. I've played Fallout 4 more than most games I've owned. Yeah. <laughs> uh, building my own junk mansions. And so, like, the the stories themselves always had a little bit of inconsistency, enough to be, like, you know, explainable. It's never, like, you know, there there is a continuum, you know, timeline and narrative, but it's not as important as the story that's being told in that specific game. And I feel like I watched this, like I was playing fallout five. I was watching this, like this is going to have stuff that was like, Oh, it's probably going to call back to other games. And then I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. That might be slightly different from how it is. But at the same time, that's not the important part. 
they're they're yeah. still they're telling their own story and um while it's still contained within it and it's all canonical for the wider series um there's a lot of grace i give to like I've, maybe we all time conditioned me to but to like just accept yeah. the fact that information is distorted over time and distance people are going to tell the story slightly wrong so i'm more open to the possibility of an unreliable narrator kind of stuff going on so if, if i see something like that says this is exactly how this happened i don't take it at face value and that's just like i'm like maybe it will be that ca the case um but until I see otherwise, I'm like, all right, that's what they think happened. And right. then let's see what else happens. So I think that the danger that comes from a lot of people who have difficulty with adaptations is they're not willing or they're they're clouded by what they think should should be the case or they what they think they know the case is mm -hmm. instead of giving the story time to kind of explain why they think this, you know, why do they think this event happened at this time? You know, we see Max was talking about bombs dropping when he's a kid. That doesn't make sense. Uh, why would they say that? But then you watch and then it makes sense. So I think it's giving it the room and grace to tell the story it's going to tell. And then after the fact, pull it apart if you feel like it, if it's fun. But I just right. think that they, you know, the the important parts for me is that it's a fun fallout experience. And that's exactly what it was. So I have yeah. no complaints, really. Yeah. And I mean, that I think, too, like that's another reason why I'm really okay with some things being left a little bit open-ended because if that, you know, like if you can use something to make the storytelling a little bit better, it, who cares, right? But at the same time, like we've only seen season one and there's so many mysteries and so many question marks where like, it doesn't actually matter if people think, oh, well, like all of the clues point to this and that's wrong because my idea of canon says differently. But you could absolutely go into the second season and be like, no, actually, like this is, like you said, mm -hmm. like unreliable narrator. I've accepted that I'm an adaptation apologist. Um, you know, there's, <laughs> there, I'm sure that there is a line. I haven't found it yet, um, mm -hmm. but I can usually find some kind of enjoyment in most things. Um, and also, more, like you were saying, there's still mysteries that the, the open endedness gives us room to talk about it. It gives us room yeah. to theorize. It gives us reasons to rewatch. If they answered every single question as it came up it's it's one and done it's you know you watch yeah. it you're like cool like that's how i am with most movies and shows and it's not a dig on them it's just i get everything out of it in one go and i don't feel a desire or mm -hmm. pull to go back to it but by leaving those mysteries i think that it's a great selling point and it's a great thing to make you question yourself like oh how how is that actually how it happened am i remembering it correctly mm -hmm. are they remembering it correctly you know it's, it's just a lot more fun for me i'm the same way but speaking of some of like the mysteries and whatnot can we talk about everything in the vault like in these yes. first two episodes because <laughs> i'm like I, i'm on a cliff here i'm on a cliff this i think was so fascinating and loved like the storylines that we got. But what I found myself being very surprised with is how much I enjoyed always going back to the vault and getting more like little clues and mysteries of what's happening with the people living down there because that was bananas. It was. <laughs> I it loved was crazy. it. <laughs> it was crazy too because like, you know, if you've played any of the games um, versus going in blind, uh, if you're going in without any information, you see the vault and you're going to take it as it is. It's like this like utopia society. Uh, but if you've played any of the games as you peel away the layers, you realize that they're a lot more insidious. And <clears throat> most of them had some kind of social experiment aspect to them that uh, was kind of imposed upon them without most of the people's knowledge. They're kind of like studies as mm -hmm. they were um, in a way. Yeah. Very much a, uh, like a curiosity thing. And of course, you know, like they're trying to they are trying to preserve humanity, but they're also using this as a chance to say, what what do I think the perfect version of a society could be? And how do I make that happen by setting the conditions just so? Um, mm -hmm. So I think going into the show, I was like, all right, what's Vault 31's going to, uh, what's Vault 33's deal going to be? What's this? They have three, you know, interconnected vaults. Obviously, they have some kind of relationship status with each other. Um, my mind initially is always like, all right, so are they going to have one being like, low middle and then high, higher class you know how are they going to divide it so my brain is immediately there yeah um, or is one like the the neutral like one is no test whatsoever whatsoever like they're the yep. one that you leave just to be the normal one 
then the, that way they can compare the other two to like the yeah, first. control. Yeah, the yeah. The control. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they a lot of vaults are like that. You'll see like um I think there's like maybe like two or three, four vaults that are just like they were just regular vaults. They just had people in them and they just survived and there's no strings attached kind of stuff. Chilling. Um, <laughs> but then like you had like Fallout 4, their vault, they were like testing the effects of like unaware people being cryogenically frozen. That's the whole vault for Fallout 4 the opening one and you know so they all have like their special little thing but it's like only the people at the top know what it is mm -hmm. and everyone else is just kind of there to be a guinea pig so seeing that as as seeing them be kind of like a, a meritocracy i think is how they described the vault 33 you know good actions are rewarded with with um with promotions and and merits and then bad behavior is punished with a demotion or a demerit um right but nothing more harsh than that. Like, it's just like a very like passive society. And what I think is so interesting about that is because just because someone was raised in that environment doesn't mean that they can't step out of that mindset, I guess. I mean, Lucy, obviously, we see where her story goes and how she has to adapt. But you also see characters down there in Vault 33 where as they start noticing more things like they start to question things especially norm being like he's i i love him he is my favorite little detective like <laughs> he's he he's was wonderful. a surprise standout yeah he yeah. was really good and you know with his sidekick sidekick chet showing the other side you know <laughs> i being love somewhat their buddy to go. buddy cop energy between these two is great <laughs> yeah like he was willing to to go along and kind of push the boundary a little bit but you see like there's a point where he's like no this is this is breaking my status quo and i kind of just want to go back to my comfort comfortable life despite what i know um, yeah it's, it's it's great to see them kind of be the two opposite sides of that where norm is very much like he's aware he's like he, he's he's suspicious he's he's questioning and you know they're aware of that and i think that in a way they like that trait in him because of like the deeper experiment and the purpose behind the vaults there i think that he is they want they don't they want to encourage him in a way but like at the same time he's also dangerous to them because they're encouraging him to be a free thinker and kind of a mm -hmm. taking charge even though he's he's a self-confessed coward as he says it very much mac energy <laughs> i'm not a i'm not he's like i'm not very brave i'm i hid kind of stuff but but there yeah. he is you know going into crazy situations yeah, like his his superpower, I guess, if you will, is just like his intuitive nature. Like he's very curious and intuitive, but he's also he has kind of this like like grumpy personality. And you know, like guys been through a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not a bad thing, but I really appreciated how he's, you know, from what it seems like the first time in his life, he's truly alone. His sister is gone. His father is gone. And like this really pushes him to where he steps up to start kind of lurking about and checking out what was happening in the other vault. And that too, like, I love how that mystery was set up because for me, I didn't know what to think. Like I saw that there had been some type of like, it looked like a battle or something, but then like later it's like, no, like they, they lost their minds. Like yeah. any, they would have opened the door for anyone. And yeah, like, it's very much, you know, episode one too. That's a, he goes over there before, while the party's yeah. going on. Yeah. And he's checking things out, but I don't know. Like I thought that was a really interesting set piece of its own that really felt like I was getting a lot of like this like mystery aspect to things while the other storylines felt more like more of like maybe a typical like quest story mm -hmm. if that makes sense but yeah like I think I think for these two episodes I'd be very hard pressed to I guess pick a favorite aspect or plot point or character even yeah there's just so many great moments like highlights like so you have norm discovering the the vaults for like the difference in vault 32 and, and making his own connections like they all these people are dead like these are not the vault dwellers from 32 and then you know he puts the pieces together later, later we have um the you know the the classic the three main point of view characters meeting at once like in the in in the book like the the worlds colliding mm -hmm. um we have actually meeting the target uh yeah and in a town in a shanty town uh 
of, of junk and uh, <laughs> all the different vendors selling iguanami and yeah. uh, foot regrowth serums and whatnot. I love the guy. I love the guy trying to sell his serum serums to to fix any malady. Like that guy. I was so happy when he came back. Oh, the chicken fucker. Oh. <laughs> It's such oh god he's so funny he's so funny oh man he's uh, such a like in that's that that's the charm like those kind of characters are in the game like the, yeah like those like the hunched farmer guy those are in the games like they're just like short shorts this could all be yours uh, i'm not gonna be around too much longer he's oh, like man. thanks for not killing me and she's like yeah sure yeah like a, a lot of his dialogue with it felt like it felt like a dialogue tree, like stuff like, and she was choosing yeah. the nice options. Like it was, it was very, it, he was such an NPC and I love, I yeah. loved his NPC energy because he was just like, all right, uh, do you want to stay? You're, you're very nice. <laughs> Thanks for not killing me. Uh, most people would have shot me dead. Um, she's like, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And she's so nice. She's so nice mm -hmm. to him. And he's like, that's probably the nicest interaction he's ever had in his entire life. Which is saying something. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Well, okay. We're probably, we'll wrap this up, but I'm really excited when we do the next one on your channel, because what I love about these two episodes is how much Lucy, like, like you were saying, like she keeps choosing the nice option and then we start to stray from that and it gets, it gets good. It gets good. Yep. Yep. She's, she's still, she's still in her world, in her own head. And um, everyone keeps telling her to stop doing that. Um, and eventually she's got to figure that out, but it's very right. much, it's very much on par. It's just very, it's, it's the perfect essence of the first time you play through a game and you're just like, I don't want to be mean to these characters. Why would I want to be mean to them? They're right. They're, they're not doing anything to me. And then, then you're like, oh, they probably could have or would have. And then you yeah. reload the save after they shoot you in the head or whatever. But yeah, and then we end this episode on her like sawing off someone's head, like okie dokie. <laughs> plan D, uh, Vault Text Plan D. Yeah. Uh. Yep. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up there. And then if you've made it to the end, make sure you check the link below. And the next episode will be on Kevin's channel. So thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. And we will see you back next time.